You know, I think it's good to get our spiritual bearings. So in terms of God's spiritual plan, where are we and where are we headed? Now, it wasn't that long ago that we went through Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. If you recall, we talked about the sacrifice of Christ, the remission of sin. We talked about things like getting rid of sin, putting leaven out, and eating the bread of sincerity and truth. So we pictured, we, we acted out these concepts that God was going to remove us from sin. And he did it by great miracles, ten great plagues. He has to free us from those that had held us captive. We used to not have a choice. But what happened on the last day of unleavened bread, right? What happened there? He had brought them to the Red Sea. And then God did a miracle and he parted the Red Sea. And so ancient Israel acted out just like we act out the Passover and these things. They acted out baptism. They went into the watery grave and they came back up on the other side. And God did all kinds of miracles just in that. It wasn't just the parting of the Red Sea. He blew a wind and made the land dry. And then he made sure everyone knew that God calls people in their own time. And so those he was working with at that moment, they could pass through. But he was an enemy to Pharaoh's armies because when they tried to come, God would take the wheels off the chariots. And then he would have the water come back on them. They didn't get a ride through on dry ground. But God's people, God did a miracle to lead them right up to the point of being baptism, baptized, right? So they get out on the other side, all right? So now they have been symbolically baptized. Sin, physical sin, and that slavery where you have no choice has been left behind them. And in another miracle, every single one, hundreds of thousands of warriors, the world's top warring nation, the best soldiers the world could provide, 100% of them died. Have you ever heard of a battle where there are hundreds of thousands of warriors on this side, no army people on this side, and every one of these warriors died, and not one of these, harm, these defendless citizens died, and they never raised a hand? That too was a miracle. God does miracles, even getting you and I to baptism. God does lots of miracles to get us to that point. So now at this point, they're singing a song, all right? At this point in time, ancient Israel is thinking, I've got it made. There are no more problems. It's easy sledding. No more effort, no more stress. We've got a ticket to ride to the promised land, and it's a nice, smooth sailing. But what they didn't realize is that they were going to be wandering for 40 years. That God had a lot of training and perfecting to do in them. That this was not the end of the journey. This was actually just the beginning of the journey. They didn't understand that. And they didn't learn. And what, they, what really happened is they wasted their time. They wandered 40 years and produced no fruit. Right? So they wasted and did not learn anything from their wandering years. Right? We too have entered our wandering years. Okay? We have definitely done that. So for us, the wandering years is not a set number in terms of 40 years. But what it is, it is the time from our baptism to the time of our death or Christ's return, whichever happens first. Those are the years that we've been allotted to wander. But we've been given a choice. We can act like ancient Israel or we can act like something different. We can use those years well or we can use them not so well. Now if you will, let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. Now we've read this scripture before. I read it often because it is so fundamental into understanding and to how we approach the Bible, how we, how we learn from the Bible, and what God's focus is. So in 1 Corinthians 10, and I'll start in verse 1, all right? So we're talking about these Old Testament examples. Why are they there? What are we supposed to learn from them? And God makes it clear. He says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware 
that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. So who is he talking about? Not just the Old Testament, but he's talking about ancient Israel in particular. He's talking about this Exodus story, right? They passed through the sea. They were all baptized. See, I'm not making this stuff up. God is using these terminology. He uses analogies to help us to understand. He lets us see things physically so we start to comprehend the depth and the meaning of things spiritual. He says, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud in the sea. All ate of that same spiritual food. They all drank of that same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now look what it says in verse 5. Alright? Verse 5 it says, But with most of them God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So those 40 years of wandering, God wasn't very happy for them. And as a result, they all died. Their carcasses, their bodies just fell over and decayed. So, so God was not happy with them. So the way that ancient Israel used that time from baptism till their death was not very productive. Was not very pleasing to God. Most. Alright? So now drop down to verse 11 and we start to see what God was upset with. What was he hoping they would learn? And they certainly didn't learn. it. So in verse 11, he says, Now all these things happened unto them as examples, that they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the earth have come. Let's take that apart just a second. So this story has happened, and this story is recorded in the Bible for our, for our Admonition. This is New Testament time that Paul is writing this. And we're being told this was written. All these things happened for modern day Christians. For your benefit. For my benefit. So now we have to ask ourselves. What does the word admonition mean? And it means mild rebuke. It's a warning. Think about what God is saying. He says, I put this in here. I use the story of ancient Israel because I know thousands of years later, my people, God's church that I call out, are going to have these same exact tendencies. And I want you to have a choice. I want you to be able to choose a path that is different than the one they chose so that you can reap a different reward. A different reward. They got death. Wandered aimlessly. Accomplished nothing. Wasted their lives. And die with nothing eternal. That is not what he wants for you. So he says, this is going to be a mild rebuke. A warning for those who will hear. Those who will listen. Those who will heed what God is saying. He says, I know it's going to be the same type of situation. The same type of attitudes are going to exist in the end time. And so these scriptures were written for our benefit. Alright? So the church... There's a scripture that says that, that ancient Israel, they were the church in the wilderness. So we're talking about God's church, whether it be in ancient Israel times, in Paul's time, or in our time. You can give it a different name. You can call it the Church of God, United Church of God. You can call it the Church in the Wilderness. You can call it the New Testament Church. You can say it's the Church at Antioch. You can use whatever name you want, but we're talking about those people that God's called out and working with. See, ancient Israel, they did not learn from their 40 years of wandering. They never got it. Right? They never got it. They wandered without a purpose. They did not learn the lessons that God wanted them to learn. What about us? Are we willing to learn from their mistakes? Or are we bound to repeat them? In fact, what have we learned? In the last year, what have we learned? Have we learned and have we learned to the point where we live differently about putting sin out? Or about putting the eternal bread of truth and sincerity into our hearts and minds? Alright? What have we learned about replacing sin? Since 31 AD, the church of God has been wandering. And the bodies and the carcasses litter the pages of history. So my point today, while we are wandering in the wilderness of sin, by wilderness today I mean Satan's society, this culture that we're in that permeates us, our self-will, our own desire to be our own bosses. So we live in a sin 
environment. Self-Satan society, I was taught. These are the things we have to fight. So as we are wandering in this wilderness of sin, did we, will we learn and grow and change? Or will we just go on our merry way, never learning, just continuing to be the same old people we were? The title today is The Wandering Years. 40 years of wandering or 40 years of learning? All right. Now, when ancient Israel went through the Red Sea, they were in Goshen. It was about 500 miles uh, from the Red Sea to the Promised Land. So, if we put this into context, that's like going from Kelowna to Calgary. I think that's about 510 miles. Okay. Now, with about a million and a half or two million people, at longest, that should have taken about three months. It took 40 years. That's an awful lot of time that got wasted. Right? So we want to ask ourselves, do we want to waste the rest of our lives wandering around accomplishing nothing of significance value when we look at it spiritually? Or do we want to walk a different path? All right? Um, so what they didn't understand. What is it that ancient Israel didn't understand? What should we understand? All right? So let's go to Acts 7. In Acts 7... We're going to pick up the story, and what we're going to see here, um, it's pretty well accepted that Luke wrote the book of Acts. So let's just say that's true. So now we have an apostle, and we're going to see, and notice as we read this in Acts 7, we're going to see how this apostle Luke is teaching them to apply and gain spiritual lessons from the story of ancient Israel and this Exodus journey. We can see how he is admonishing God's people with the Old Testament in ancient Israel's example, or poor example, if you will. Okay, So, let's pick up the story in uh, verse 38 is where we will see, um, in verse 8, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness, right? So we see that term, congregation in the wilderness. Go to verse 39. All right, let's start to see what they failed to learn and God wants us to learn. Whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us of God to go before us, as this was with Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. Oh, we don't see him. Out of sight, out of mind, let us go back to our old ways. So they had left sin. They had left they had left Pharaoh in Egypt. They were no longer forced to be of that old mindset. But you know what they did? In their hearts and mind, they had drug Egypt with them. And it didn't take much. Huh, have you seen Moses? No, nah, he's been missing a day or two. Huh, let's get a golden calf. Let us go back to the old way. Let us not learn. Let us not change. All right? And look what it says. It said that they would not obey. That's a choice. And they instead rejected God. And it happened in their hearts. In their hearts, they didn't leave Egypt. So this is one of the things that God's wanting us to know. Right? There's physically putting out leaven. But it's a different matter from the heart, from the mind, to put sin out. To not even want to go back that way. There's a physical example where God says, you know what? When, when you're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, don't even look back. It's not even, don't even look that way. Don't consider that. You've got to guard your mind. And when Lot's wife looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt. So, ancient Israel, in their hearts, they wanted to go back. Look at verse 51. And again, God is making it clear. He's starting to illuminate things, things that were wrong, that they refused to change. Because he wants you and I to be rebuked, to be corrected, to be warned from walking this path. And in verse 51, it says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Notice this questioning. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming of the just one of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. So, look at what he's saying. Ancient Israel totally refused, totally refused to learn. 
They refused to change. They refused to grow, no matter what God did. He said they were stiff-necked. They were stubborn. That means unmovable in opinion. They were not teachable. He says they were uncircumcised both in their heart and their ear, meaning they were unwilling to listen, to hear what you said, to grasp what, what you mean, to get the understanding and say, oh, you're trying to make me one of a child of God. You're trying to build your character in me. You want to offer me everything you've given to Christ. What a loving father. What a wonderful plan. But they were unwilling to hear. No, nope, no, nope, I don't want to hear it. I don't want you to see the kids. Sometimes they say, tell it to the hand. Means, I don't care what you're saying. I'm not going to listen to you. You might, be in a, uh, you might be in a position of authority, but I reject it. I have closed my mind, my heart off from you. I'm not interested in knowing what your plan is. I'm not interested in being part of it. Get out of here. Get out of here. Right? So, they go to great lengths to avoid hearing God's corrective instruction. To the point that God challenged them. Can you name even one prophet that you didn't shut up? Either by beating them, giving them, stoning them, throwing them into prison, or sometimes just flat out killing them. He says, you have made it abundantly clear. You refuse to learn. You refuse to cooperate. And so you will get your just desserts. A man will reap what he sows. So every one of them died. They just fell over dead with no future. No inheritance of the promised land. Because that's what they chose. It reminds me of the scripture in Revelation. Do you remember? Because we see that this failure to learn and be taught by God, it was a problem for an ancient Israel, is a problem for the apostolic church with Luke, and is a problem at the end of the age. If you will, go to Revelation 9 and verse 20. All right? Remember, when we talk about the Great Tribulation, the vast majority of mankind is killed. Some people claim only maybe a tenth live. That's either a tenth of Israel or maybe the tenth of the world population. But whatever it is, we are talking about billions of people being dead in a very short time by miraculous means by the hand of God. Look at what it says in Revelation 9 and verse 20. Okay? But the rest of the dead mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone, and wood, which can neither be seen nor hear nor walk. They refused to repent. They refused to change. They're happy with status quo, continuous things go on. But it's not just one scripture taken out of context. Drop down to Revelation 16 and verse 9. Once again, and I'm not going to read all of them, I'm just going to read you a couple so we get an idea of what's happening. And so here in Revelation 16 and verse 9, it says, And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has the power over these plagues. So once again, we're talking these plagues, and all this death and destruction, and they did not repent and give Him glory. There is a stubbornness in the human mind and heart that resists God, wants to do it our own way, doesn't want to say, I need help. Please change me. If you'll remember, at the time that you and I were baptized, that's where we were. We were broken. And we said, God, if you're willing, I give everything. I give the right for self-governance. I give everything to you. If you can make my life of value, if you can shape me into something wonderful and good, I'll be eternally grateful. But I am by myself nothing, and I am capable of producing nothing of lasting value. I surrender to you. I will be your slave rather than Satan's slave. But it's easy, as God blesses us, and as he gives us blessings, and as we go along, for pride to come in, to get distracted, and to forget, to stay humble, to stay teachable, and let God finish the work he began in us. All right? So the point is God is wanting us to choose a different path. Instead of stubbornness, teachability. Instead of wandering aimlessly with no change, no growth, he wants us to be very productive in these wandering years. If you will, go to Psalms 78. And we'll just start in verse 40 to 42. That whole psalm is really talking a lot about 
you know, the need for repentance, a need to change. But notice what he says about ancient Israel. We see again this nature, this thing that God wants us to learn from, to be reproved with, right? He said, how often did they provoke him in the wilderness and they grieved him in the desert? Yes, again and again they tempted God and what? And they limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from their enemy. The question I ask myself is, do we remember the power of God? What he has done for others as recorded in the Bible. Do we comprehend that that is fact, that it is truth, and he says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? If he would do those miracles for them, he's willing to do them for you and me. Do we remember all the answered prayers God has already granted us? Do we realize how much power and energy that he controls when he can just listen and respond to your individual prayer, to my individual prayer? Right? Do we remember the anointings and healings? I can tell you stories of how I was anointed and I was miraculously healed. I can tell you how my daughter was born through anointing. Do I forget that? Do I forget that the God of heaven has the power and the heart to listen to tiny old Dan's little prayer, to my wife's prayer, that was somehow these insignificant little specks on the planet matter to him? Do we remember those to the point that it changes our life, changes our outlook, changes what we believe and what we don't believe? All right? How clearly do we recall the miracles God has performed for us? Do we understand ancient Israel limited? They retarded the goodness of God. God wanted to give them so many blessings, so much encouragement, so many nice things, so much honor, so much glory, so much peace of mind, so much quality of life, so much riches in heaven stored up. And yet they said, you know what? We don't believe you. We don't trust you. We're going to, give, uh, we're going to equate to you false motives. And so they limited how much of God's goodness could be stowed upon them? Kind of like a child who's just a brat acting up, has a terrible attitude. There was a period of time where my daughter was this way and I had hold on to gifts I wanted to give her for weeks. And I had sometimes would turn them back into the store because in good conscience as a loving father, I could not reward a rotten, spoiled attitude. God in heaven is no different. And ancient Israel retarded. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Do you want to limit God's influence in your life? I certainly don't want to limit God's influence in my life. I do not want to limit any good thing He can give me or what He can do inside of me. Could He change my nature, my character? So I really love other people. I want the best for you. I want the best for those in Victoria that I would pray for them and I would mean it and I could somehow love people that I might be thousands of miles away. That doesn't happen by me. I can't make myself think good thoughts. But I certainly don't want to limit how much God can change my heart, my mind, my soul, my character to make me something respectable, to make me something valuable, to make me a child of God. Because that's my nature. So I certainly don't want to limit it. So whatever I'm reading, whenever I'm going through these scriptures, whatever ancient Israel is doing, I want to go the opposite direction. Not just a little bit, not just with a, a slow pace, but I want to run the other way. I want to run toward God. I want to see what would life be like. What would a year be like where God was not retarded? He was not constrained in any way. I wonder if even physically I could live physically if God blessed me with his full capacity. If I did nothing to limit him, not one ounce. I don't know, but I sure would like to find out. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to know what would it be like to live a whole year where I got the full benefit of all of God's power, all of God's goodness to change and grow and develop? I think that would be something amazing. All right? Now, and it's interesting that this thing, right, when, when they're doing it, it was just 72 hours after the Red Sea that they're wanting to have this golden calf built. Look at how quickly, after all these miracles, they just turned. It's, it's like they're dense. 
it's like everything was just bouncing off of them. Nothing stuck. Like water off the duck's back. Here, miracle after miracle, amazing things. Here's a promise, a world, a, 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 a destiny that's glorious. And they're like, what? I don't know. Who cares? It kind of reminds me of, of Esau, right? Selling his birthright. Oh, it's just birthright. Yeah, a bowl of soup, a little lentils. Great. Done. Sold. But we're supposed to look differently. We're supposed to think differently. If you will, let's go to Deuteronomy 8. And we're going to see that this wandering, this time, it's not pointless. And it's not wandering with no purpose. Now, as man would see, when we look at, I don't know if they have that little chart up there, but ancient Israel, they wandered around. right? They did all this, but from point A to point C, it was a straight line. It shouldn't have taken very long. 40 years. Now, no human being would graft out this windy thing. Some of these places, it looks like they're going around in circles. I could hear them saying, oh, I think we've been here again. This looks familiar. Yep, been there, done that. It looks like aimless, pointless wandering. But it is the plan of God, and God has a purpose. Now, depending on how we respond to God, it could be aimless wandering and produce no fruit. But if we do it God's way, God has a reason why he does it. He has a reason for your life. What good things have happened, what trials have happened, what hurdles were happening. And it's individualized to you and it's individualized to me. And it will be like this great um, uh, training regimen if we will cooperate. Otherwise, we just wander aimlessly and die. But look in De Deuteronomy 8 and we'll start in verse 1. It says, you know, so we're talking about in this concept here where we're going to talk about He's talking about remember the Lord your God. He says, every commandment which I commanded you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto you. And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years. So for you and I who are called, there is nothing by chance. Our whole 40 years, from baptism to death, God is orchestrating and working and letting it be done in a way that we can learn the lessons we need to learn if we cooperate. He says, all these 40 years in the wilderness, why? To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart. He wants to know, have we learned the lessons? Have we learned to obey and trust God? Have we learned to be a child of God? Do we have the nature of God to, to know you and to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not? So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. And you and your fathers did not know that he might make you to know uh, man shall not live by every bread alone, but by man shall live by every word of God that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you see here, when we talk in the church and we go from the physical to spiritual, that's exactly what God wants us to do. These physical things happen to teach us spiritual lessons. And what he did is he fed them for these 40 years. He fed them with bread from heaven as a type so that we start to understand what sustains us is not our job. What sustains us is not what is our physical health. What sustains us is the spiritual nourishment that we choose to either put in or we ignore and just go on our way because all the way, we have enough physical food, bread. We don't need the spiritual bread. So he's saying these things were done to teach them lessons. He was hoping they would learn it, but they never did. But you and I can. You and I can. So the purpose was to humble you, to test you, to see are you on track, do you respond, do you think the right way, do you think in terms of spiritual development, overcoming, changing, or do you always think of the physical, right? Now let's go to verse 14, verse 14, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land. And there was no water. And he brought you water for you out of the rock and the flint. So he's saying, when you need water, all these physical things, I'm going to provide them for you. Will you learn to distrust me? And they had 40 years of proof. And in 40 years of evidence, they turned away from 40 years of evidence. They turned away from all those miracles. 
right? Think about that. A desert where there's not enough water anyway. And he watered a million and a half to two million people. How many? It says they came out with a high hand with much cattle, sheep, ox, and camels. How much water do all those need? And he did it for 40 years. I don't know. Do you need to get water every other day? It doesn't take very long. You're dehydrated and you die. You can go without food a lot longer. But they ignored all of this evidence of God's nature, God's kindness, God's faithfulness to provide for them. Will you and I do that? Will we ignore that? Will we ignore or will we learn to trust Him? Depend on Him, right? They would see His... They would listen to His words. They would see His miracles. And they were never changed by it. They just went on. Life keeps going on as it was. There was no urgency to change. So I ask you, have we internalized that God loves us? Have we internalized even what it just said there? That God that we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That we've learned how to take this Bible and find some principle for everything we do every day. How do we work? What type of employer are we? Who do we work for? Who do we not? When do we quit working on Friday? When they say 5 o'clock and say, oh well, the Sabbath is at 4.30, but I'll just go an extra half hour. But when it's in the summer, I'll work and I'll, I'll get off a little early. Do we justify it? Or are we diligent to obey, carefully observe, and do all the commands? How sincere, how careful are we to obey God's law? And to obey not in the letter of the law only, but from the Spirit. These are the things that God wants us to know and understand. If you will, let's go to James 1. There's an important principle over here. And when I read this, I want us to think about how does this apply to ancient Israel? How would this apply to the time that it was written, that first century church of God? And how would that apply to the church of God today, the united church of God? Because I'm going to say to you, it applies equally. In James 1, and we'll start in verse 22, all right? This is a section that my Bible labels doers, not hearers. In verse 22, but be you doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the Bible, and continues in it, he is not a forgetful hearer, but he is a doer of the work. This one shall be blessed in what he does. So ancient Israel heard God's word. It was read to them. They would even say, oh, we'll do all you said, and then just go about their way. They never changed. James was giving this message at this time because that was a problem in the church. Too many people heard the word of God, knew about the Sabbath and holy days, but never got around to the business of changing their nature, their character, changing their heart, changing their mind, never got about to the internal business of becoming God, thinking like God. Today in the church, right, we can read about church heirs, the Laodicean, the lukewarm church. Not, we just sang a song, not called to be lukewarm or cold, but to be zealous as the days of old, zealous like Caleb, who had a different spirit and he produced a different fruit. When they got to the promised land, those couple of months later after first leaving, Caleb was ready to go in. And when he gave his report about the land, he says, don't listen to all these people who give you a false report. Listen to me. Don't you see what God did? How he passed through Egypt and destroyed the most powerful nation on earth? We are more than capable of passing through the promised land. Why? Because he had a different spirit. He made a different choice and he said, you know what? I will not act like all these other millions of people. I will not forget what God has done. I will understand that God loves his people. God will defend his people. God will provide for his people. God will fight my battles. So yes, there might be the sons of Anakin in that thing. There may be giants. They may be millions of army people, but it does not matter because I will trust God. And if God said, I give you this land, I will move forward. 
Caleb had a different spirit. He remembered what God did. He applied those lessons personally. And he then was full of enough faith. He was capable of walking into that land. But they didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. They did not listen to Joshua and Caleb. So therefore, God put them on plan B. You're going to have 40 years to wander to hopefully learn your lesson, to grow and develop. What I'm saying to you, we don't want to wait 40 years to grow and develop. We can be like Caleb. We can decide to obey now. Take each and every one of these words of God and live it and become it. We could have a sense of urgency to overcome now, to put forth the energy and the effort, to be all we can be, to let God have his perfect work. Do not limit what he can do inside of you, how quickly you can change, how quickly you can overcome, how quickly and how much good fruit you can bear, how much of a positive impact you can be on your spouse, on your kids, on your congregation, and the church at large. How much of a force can you be for God's way? What kind of example can you set of living God's way every day to the full extent? How bright might that light shine? How much that might that encourage another brother to walk the right way, to try a little harder, to be a little more on fire? There is nothing wrong with being on fire and looking a little strange and saying, you know, no, nope, I'm not watching TV this Wednesday. That's, that's my Bible, Bible study. Well, I didn't know your church had a Bible study. Oh, they don't. I've just set aside the time to study the Bible. In fact, I'm studying ancient Israel and all their mistakes, and I'm asking myself, am I 100% sure I've learned this lesson in my life, and I am not repeating it? In fact, I am an example of the exact opposite. We all have choices. What will we do with all this time of wandering we have? Will we do it? Right? So ancient Israel, and at Christ's time, and in our church today, there is an attitude that can so easily creep in where we are content to be in the right group, to be God's church, God's people. And I'm telling you, that will not cut it. That is not enough. It is not enough to say, I'm on the roster of the United Church of God. I believe in the Sabbath and the holidays, and I tithe. It's not enough. God wants us obeying all of his principles all of the time. Romans says those who are led by the Holy Spirit are the sons of God. That means each and every day we wake up and it's not our choice. What do we do? We ask God, how should I best use my time? What is the right attitude to have? You know, I think someone's struggling in the church. What are the right words? Do they need a word or do they need just someone to come alongside of them? What can you do in my spirit and my heart so I'll know what to do? Will you guide me? Will you give me the words? Is there a gift I need to give to them? Do I need to just pray for them? Pray? Do I need to fast for them? And no one even knows it except you. But that's okay because you're the most powerful force in the universe. If I can move you, I can move a mountain. Because God can do anything. So, how much are we going to do it? But we must be learning. We must be changing. We must be growing. We must be overcoming. We must be responding to that Holy Spirit. That God's teaching can be alive. His correction, His nudging. Hmm, you're a little off course, Dan. Move a little bit to the left. Oh, that's a little too far. Move a little bit to the left. Now wait there and trust me. This isn't something you can do. You have to wait for me to do this. You have to wait for me to correct the leadership in the church or whatever it may be. Right? So we're talking about a very deep personal relationship with God. But it's not ancient Israel. They were content with being God's people. We need to be committed to becoming like God, to becoming one of his children, where his nature and character emanates from us. That's a very different thing than coasting. Right? So do we act like Christ? Do we think like God? Do we desire godly things? Do we seek? Is it our number one desire? If someone says, do you want a billion dollars or would you like to be growing in the righteousness of God? How many of us honestly would say, I'll take growing in righteousness of God and let the billions be wherever they are? Do we understand that what we're choosing is far more valuable, both today and in the world to come? So it is in the doing, living God's way from the heart, responding to God's instruction that we will choose a different path than ancient Israel did. Right? Now let's go to Hebrews 12. 
Right? So once again, we see that God is going to continue to give us instructions, give us admonitions, to guide us in how we should be going. And it's going to be in a way that was different than ancient Israel. Right? Now we understand, though, that not all of this feels great at the moment. Right? It's a lot more fun to get up here and give a message. God loves you. He's got all this love. Don't worry about things. And God does love you. And there is lots of forgiveness. But if that's the only message you get, it won't be helpful. It won't lead to good things. So in Hebrews 12, and let's start in verse 9. Okay? Furthermore, we have, we have had, okay, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So here God is telling us, right? So verse 11. Now no chastening seems be to be joyful at the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained in it. So this is very important, all right? So ancient Israel, they ignored God's instruction. God has said, that was written there for your correction, for my reproof, that I could learn from it. Because I'm, on, I'm naturally on that path of ancient Israel, unless I will respond to this correction. That means I have to say, I'm already just like them. And I now have the choice to change and overcome. If I don't do something, I, will, I am them. I will wind up exactly like they were. So I have to understand, in reality, I'm already over here. I have the nature of ancient Israel. You have the nature of ancient Israel. And it's our job to move to the nature of God. And he's saying, look, I understand it doesn't feel good to read in there and say, I have all these flaws. Deep down in my heart, that's who I am. Unless I've repented, unless God has changed my nature and character. And it would be smart to go through all of those examples. To look at every one of the things that God highlights and say, am I honestly different? Am I the exact opposite? And he's saying, we understand that our human fathers correct us and we love them and respect them. My dad and mom did not let me grow up to be a spoiled little brat. I didn't like all the paddlings I got when I was a kid. I can remember thinking, I'm never going to forgive you. I'm going to stay so mad. But I couldn't because they really loved me. They weren't doing it for their own benefit. But they did it as best they understood. And not every correction truly was in the right measure at the right time. Because they're just human. And God's saying, do you understand that our Heavenly Father, there's no accidental, unintended consequences. Everything He does, every correction, every sermon to improve is for our betterment. It only will produce profit for us. It is purely out of love and for our benefit that he does these things. And it will lead us to this attitude and to this condition that righteousness will be the fruit. You have the ability to bear the fruit of righteousness. I have the ability to bear the fruit of righteousness. And when we bear that fruit, we are the children of God. And then we're just waiting for our new bodies because we've already become the new creature. We've already become the new man. We have to become the new man before Christ returns. There's a ticking of a clock. I don't know how long you have. I don't know how long I have. But it's not long enough that we can just drift along and think status quo is okay. That's not going to cut it. All right? So this is very interesting, right? Um, so we all have that tendency to wander or to drift. I call it spiritual drift. I'm not going against God, but if you're not actively pushing and swimming upstream, you will not be building the character of God, what's required. We cannot drift along. We are not in an environment where life can be easy. We have to be killing the old man. That's a violent thing. It was hard to kill my pet when it came time to put her down, princess. It's hard to kill ourselves and to squash selfishness and self-ambition and self-promotion and the things I want and the timing that I want, and how I think the church should be ran. It's hard to push all that down. It takes energy, it takes effort, it takes on-purpose living on a day-to-day -day basis. Choice after choice after choice. 
right? So we might struggle with our past programming. We saw how ancient Israel carried these ideas and these ways of the world right on with them even after baptism, right? Are we stuck in a cycle of sin, right? After the days, after the days of unleavened bread, are we now still living in newness of life? Are we being trained by God? Are we responding to all his message he gives us? All the promptings of the Holy Spirit that says, Ooh, I think that applies to you, Dan. I think you have a little bit of this over here, right? So we have to ask ourselves, right? Have we grasped the significance of what the history in the Bible is telling us? That you and I have the same tendency to wander through life, to drift through life, content with being in God's church without fully overcoming, changing, and being corrected by God. So have we been instructed, or are we wandering? How have we learned to live each and every day as it comes? Or are we, are we seeing that we are experiencing a metamorphosis, where we are changing? And we're changing in fundamental ways, like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's not just a prettier caterpillar. It's not just a bigger, more beautiful caterpillar. It becomes something new where you almost can't even tell these two things are related. That's the type of change we need to be doing on the inside. All right? Now, I know that we don't have time to cover all the things in here. And I know that if all we did was come to church and listen to the message and go home, it would not be enough spiritual food for you and I to wind up where we need to be. So I'm going to give you 10 points. I'm not going to elaborate on a lot of them. But what I'm going to do is give you some ideas to think about. So it's up to you. Do you want to learn the lessons of ancient Israel? Do you want to make sure you're on a different path? So what I'm going to do is we're going to highlight 10 points that you can find in the book of Numbers. Because the book of Numbers is interesting. It covers 38 years of those 40 years of wandering. So right from the pages of your Bible, just that one book, we're going to pull out 10 things that you can on your own time go back and study and say, this is how ancient Israel was. God wasn't very happy. Yet. What are the spiritual counterparts that God would want me to avoid or to add in? What would be the opposite that I could do? And if we're smart, we'll go through that process and let a man examine himself, examine ourselves and say, how much different am I than ancient Israel? And is that, am I on track to become the person I need to become? Or is there work still to be done? Okay? So we're just going to highlight a few of them, and they'll be there for us to think about, to look at. So there's more than this in that book. But these are just a, full, a few of them that I pulled out. Lesson number one, or point number one to examine. You know, and I was thinking about this. What if we made a deal for ourselves to examine all of these things, to take extra time, extra Bible study by Pentecost? Okay? So what is that, about three weeks? So if we did two of these a week or three a week, take a little extra time on the Sabbath, maybe on Friday night, maybe one day during the week. Because I got to thinking, realistically, if I don't do this exam, if I don't follow these ten points and really analyze where am I by Pentecost, when do I think I'm going to actually get around to doing that, <laughs> right? When would I really examine that? Am I going to wait till after Pentecost when we're talking about the Holy Spirit? Am I going to wait till a week before um, the Feast of Tabernacles and I'm busy planning and doing all that? The reality is, for me, if I don't do it between now and Pentecost, the odds are more than likely I won't do it for the rest of the year. I don't know if I can afford that. All right, so it's just, yeah, I'm just throwing out there for something to think about. But point number one, reliance on God, right? So they had to rely on God for everything, right? They had to rely on God for food, for water, clothing that never wore out, right? When they would get bitten by a by poisonous snake, they, God provided healing, right? So they had learned to do that. But what about us? You know, in John 6, it says that Christ is the bread of life, right? Have we internalized that? You know, have we learned to let God be our sole thing, right? Do we seek first the kingdom of God? So let's ask ourselves, you know, how much are we willing to rely on God? If we need a job and we're not going to be able to pay the mortgage, can we still trust God? So that's one thing. Look and see how they responded. How much did they trust? When did they trust God? And how quickly did they not trust him? 
and see how do we compare? Are we in good shape? Now they saw God every day. They didn't, they didn't deny God's existence, right? So they had a pillar every day to look at. What do we look at every day? How do we know that God is alive and real? How do we every day live with the reality God is there when I can't see Him? What have we done? How am I living that way, right? Do, how clearly is God in charge of my life? Right? God gave them direction. You know what? They knew where to go every day because that pillar of cloud would move. How do you know what to do, when to move, when to not to move, when to speak, when not to speak, right? How do we do that? Have we learned to look for God, for words, for examples? Nineteen times Christ says, follow me, right? Do we follow him in terms of his value, his lifestyle? When he's falsely accused, he doesn't revile back. Do we follow him in that? How many things in our life? Every aspect, do we follow God and do it His way? Not even, even when we don't understand why, right? So we can ask ourselves these things, right? The need for healing, right? God gave that. There was even the bronze serpent they could touch and get better, right? Think about what the scripture says. It talks about the plagues of your heart, right? God says that He came that man might have life. He came that, um, to heal the brokenhearted. How often do we pray? for spiritual healing, that we would respond the appropriate way back to God for all His love He gives us, all His mercies, all His miracles. Have we prayed for a soft heart that's fleshy, that can say to our spouse, I'm sorry, or when they're trying to say sorry and they have a hard time, do we make it easy? Do we make it hard? Are we the one to be first to say, you know what? It's okay. I forgive you. You know what? That was so long ago, I don't remember if you owed me money or not. Let's just write this out. Paid in full. If you didn't pay me back, that's okay. God did it. Right? Are we this way? So we can go through and we can analyze ourselves. Are we spiritually healed? Do we respond properly to people's love, to their compliments, their efforts to heal, to help? Do we help others? Do we wash their feet? And do we let other people wash our feet? Or are we too prideful for that? No, no, you can't do that. You know, he doesn't really want to help me. He's just trying to make me feel bad because I need help and I don't have a job. He thinks I need his money or whatever it is, right? There's a million things that get into our brain and lead us off the way. Christ was humble. He served and he was served, right? So are we the same way, right? Now, you know, it's interesting. In Numbers 11, we learn that God chooses the leadership in the church, right? So are we able to do that? When we see leadership we like and agree with, yay! When we see leadership and, oh, I got a minister I don't like, oh, boo! Right? But do we learn to say, you know what? That's how they come across to me. Do I understand God put them in this power? And I will trust that the head of this church can handle it. That I will give them the respect due, not because of who they are, but because of who they represent. That they're in this line of authority. And if God put them there, just like the president, it's Mr. Trump. And it was Mr. Obama, even when, wow, that was one of my least favorite presidents. But every time I called him Obama, every time I said something derogatory, I was out of line with God. I didn't learn the lesson of ancient Israel because now I think I am the one who says who should be in power and who should not. Hey, Moses, you take too much on yourself. God didn't take kindly to that. Have I really learned and internalized those lessons? Right? Do I understand and believe? And when I go through Numbers 11, I can just really take time to pray and ask God, show me my heart. Show me what's deep inside of me. What things need to change in terms of your teaching? Help me to come in line. I think that's why David prayed so much. Because he knew he couldn't change his heart. So he had to ask God to change his heart for him. And God says, I will not do it to you. I will do it with you if you've invited me in. And little by little... This process happens. And I think that's how God lets us have free moral agency and changes our nature but doesn't destroy us in the process. So, have we learned that lesson? Numbers 12 is very similar, but it's about rebellion. And then that's not acceptable to God. Aaron and Miriam, they had to learn this. Have I learned not to rebel against God's elected? 
when they're doing a good job and when they're doing a bad job. David and Saul is a great example of this. Saul was a bad leader and he wasn't doing godly things. And David was spiritually mature enough to understand, I cannot rebel against God's elected. God would, even though God had told him, you're going to be the king. <laughs> and everybody was whispering in his ears, oh, see, God, God gave him into your hand. Why don't you get rid of him? This is a, from God. David was smart enough to say, I'm not going to abide into that wrong way of thinking. It's kind of like he could have quoted Christ, get behind me, Satan. Because that's where those ideas that says, I can rebel. I can assert this authority. Um, so that's one of the things. So there are Numbers 12. We can look at that. We can read that. We can understand that, right? We can also, when you go to Numbers 12 and 20, we could also ask ourselves, look it. Moses made mistakes and sinned. Miriam, who was a prophetess, she made several ones. But one time she was turned white as leper for her sins. And yet, and Aaron made multiple mistakes. And yet these wind up in a good place because God has granted us forgiveness of sin. He's granted us this ability to repent. And so they were not defined or limited by their mistakes. You and I, when we look through here, I'll be shocked if you can say, Dan, I looked at all of these points. I'm in good shape on all of them because I'm not. I got a lot of them. But I can be encouraged that whatever sins, whatever flaws, whatever weaknesses I find, I am not stuck there. God grants us repentance. He grants us the ability to change and overcome. These can be bygone and they can be washed away as far as the east from the west. So we learn that in here. We can see and ask ourselves, are we in this repentant process? Not stuck and dropped down by past sins, but not neglecting them, but improving and imp changing, right? right? In number 16, we can see this insurrection against leadership with Korah and the Rebellion. Ask ourselves, have we learned that lesson? Are there any ways that we see that being played out today in our church, in our congregations, in the church of God at large? And are we determined not to be part of that? Number nine, there are false prophets in Numbers 22. So what are we going to do? Will we listen to false prophets or will we listen to the true prophets? We can ask ourselves, right? Paul and the New Testament writers were constantly warning that there are false teachers, there are false prophets, and we need to be on guard against that, right? What do we learn from that? Balaam and this motive, how Satan cannot take us out of the church. So what he does, he devises all these tricks to get us to take ourselves out of the church, to get us to move in a way that God now will remove us because we've rebelled. We've now started acting like ancient Israel. The last point for us to consider is diligence. Completeness is needed. Go to Numbers 14, and here we see this example of how Caleb distinguished himself very, very differently. He acted different. He had a different spirit. And you know what? Caleb has the exact same spirit that you and I were given when we were baptized. We are expected to produce a different fruit than ancient Israel. We will be an utter failure if we produce what ancient Israel did. The full expectation from God is that you and I would bear the fruit just like Caleb because God has given us the exact same thing, His Spirit. And His Spirit is a power. And we are expected to change and produce something different. All right? So we need to do a different things, right? You could put into your notes Psalm 51, where David says, create in me a clean heart. Read that and think about that and say, is this my normal way of life? Is this how I live? Am I letting it? And the other thing, Caleb didn't just follow God a little bit. It says he followed God fully. Think about that. Analyze ourselves and say, am I fully following God in every aspect of my life? All the scriptures, all the messages I've been given. Okay? So the other thing um, you might just write down in this completeness, you could put down in your notes Hebrews 3 all the way 1 through 19. But it's that last part, 15 to 19, where God says, you know what? They departed because of unbelief. They wanted faith. They lacked trust. They would not trust or they betrayed the trust that God gave them. They didn't believe in God's goodness. So as we're kind of concluding here, what lessons have we learned? How thoroughly will we analyze our spiritual condition as it relates to just even these 10 points that are contained in the history of Israel's 38 years of wandering? Right? 
remembering that it was put in the Bible for our benefit. For the first fruits who are called out of this world now, you and me, our 40 years of wandering started at baptism, they end when we die and Christ returns. Our carcasses too will fall in the wilderness of sin. But our question is, will they fall because we simply wandered and did not change? Or will they fall so that we can be given a new body because we did change, we did overcome, right? Will we avoid a life of fruitless wandering like ancient Israel lived? Or will we learn and be developed into the children of God by God's masterful direction of our lives? What have we learned? What are we learning? And what will we learn? Or will we simply wander aimlessly like ancient Israel? Like always, God gives you and I the choice, the power to choose.